As I have taught the Sims technique over the years, I've come to appreciate that the principles of the Sims technique can be used earlier and in different ways. So I have coined the term active redirection. It is what we do all the time in many ways with our patients when we provide a blocked exercise. Using active direction as a treatment approach means that you must create a new belief that active motion can create passive motion. Let's use this schematic drawing to explain what we mean. Imagine these two blue bars are two different layers of tissue and the small white lines in between are connective tissue or scar. We've labeled the direction of flexion and extension. If we then use passive range of motion or use of an orthosis to bring a finger into flexion, we have moved it in one direction only. We have elongated the tissue in one direction to allow that motion. If we were to use active redirection, we would be allowing both flexion and extension motion, and therefore the total distance of excursion gained would be greater, and it would be in reciprocal directions. So the act of redirection, rather than the passive application of force, is what creates a greater range of motion. Not to be ignored is the fact that the act of redirection is engaging the motor cortex. A classic example is the PIP flexion contracture, where we always see the MP joint hyperextended. We know from clinical experience that a patient with ulnar palsy who has developed PIP flexion contractures of the ring and little finger is able to resolve those contractures with the use of an anti-claw orthosis that blocks the MP joint and drives all the motion into the dorsal apparatus for full IP joint extension. If we can resolve a flexion contractor in this patient, why can we not use the same technique or approach to resolve flexion contractors in the PIP joint of all fingers? There are many ways to approach this. Perhaps a small leather loop attached to a string, which is non-elastic, attached to a wrist strap, is enough to block the MP joint from hyperextending. The advantage is that the patient never is able to go into the maladaptive pattern and drives motion to the PIP joint through, throughout the day, directing motion to where it's needed most. The use of the ICAM splint, which stands for Immediate Controlled Active Motion, was developed for extensor tendon injuries. This orthosis goes by many names. It's often called the relative motion, the yoke splint, the merit orthosis. It is intended to position one metacarpal phalangeal joint in a different position relative to the adjacent joint in order to take stress off of a healing tendon. We can use the same splinting technique for the fingers. We can use the same technique for the fingers for active redirection. The purpose is not so much to relatively position the MP joint as it is to control the position of the MP joint. In other words, not to let it hyperextend or hyperflex. Let's look at this just in theory. Here, you can see that this patient is flexing and extending normally. But if I block the MP joint, notice how much force is directed for PIP and DIP joint extension. He actually hyperextends. It's this change of pattern we want to create by the application of an orthosis. Here we see a patient and we have blocked the metacarpal phalangeal joint. This drives more power to the PIP joint for flexion. You'll notice that the interphalangeal joints can fully flex and all the fingers can fully extend, but we've altered the pattern. Here, we're going to look at PIP joint extension. 
where we block the ring finger in P joint inflection so that more power is driven for PIP extension. And here we've done the same thing with a view toward PIP extension of the little finger. We've had to include more fingers. If you'd like more information about the active redirection, go to our course on the obstinate PIP joint, which shows the construction of these orthoses and talks about the rationale for gaining PIP joint extensions and flexion specifically. These orthoses are easy to make out of a scrap of material and can be worn during daily activities so that the repetition can be continued and the maladapted pattern is never revisited. Active redirection can be used at other joints in other ways. Here on your bottom left is extension seen following treatment for a boutonniere. The patient had gained full extension, has been over vigorous on regaining flexion, and lacks 24 degrees when measured precisely. A small device is molded and taped on to the DIP joint to place it in flexion, allowing further flexion. And you can see when the patient actively extends instead of 24, the DIP flexion now increases the tension on the lateral band and the patient is able to gain to minus nine degrees. This would be an exercise device that I would leave in place most all day. And as the patient improved PIP extension, I would slowly reduce the amount of DIP flexion uh, held by this small orthosis. This is a way to shift what part of the dorsal apparatus is carrying most of the power. Another example is making a blocking splint to hold the metacarpal phalangeal joints in extension. We are redirecting all of the power to the flexor digitorum profundus. The interosseous muscles cannot actively flex the MP joint in this posture. The power of the FDP mobilizes the joints and elongates the interosseous muscles, and it also elongates the lumbrical muscles as well. If we look at the use of an orthosis to gain motion, we can only gain one direction at a time. This often means that we seesaw between gaining flexion and extension, and we feel as if we're canceling out one motion while we're gaining the other. We potentially can increase the edema because all orthoses provide some type of constriction, some better than others. But most of all, there's no cortical involvement when an orthosis is being worn. There's no engagement in the active motion. Active redirection, however, gives us an entirely different scenario. There's differential glide in reciprocal directions, which is what normal motion is all about. The edema is reduced because the pumping is increased and cortical remapping occurs because the maladapted pattern cannot be revisited and motion is directed to the stiffest joint, activating the muscles that need to be activated. <laughs>